citrus screening. What do you do about it? We'll talk about that. Plus, I'm going to be answering lots of questions from all these different Vlogmas videos today. We are in the final clown town of Vlogmas. I am so excited. Christmas is coming. It is one of my favorite times of year. And oh my goodness, is it going to be cold? So grab a hot cup of tea. Let's settle in, maybe wrap some presents, and let's answer lots of questions. And we're going to start with this question about citrus screening first. Mary P asks, I really want to plant a calamondin now. Do you do anything about citrus screening disease with these? Thanks. Christmas tree. So a little bit of basics about citrus screening. Citrus screening is a disease that's brought over by the citrus psyllid, which is like a little fly that comes from like the China area, which makes sense because oranges and citrus crops come, that's where they originate from, is that part of Southeast Asia. So Florida was the last place in the world to get hit by citrus screening and it's everywhere. Basically around the world, we have a 99% infection rate. So almost every piece of citrus that you have has it one way or the other. There's not much you can do to stop it. Actually, there's nothing you can do to stop it. It's there. It is what it is. So what can you do to slow citrus screening or stop citrus screening? There's not really anything you can do to stop it outright. The citrus psyllid is like a really tiny fly and it's blown around by wind. Once it hit Florida in 1998, what really caused it to spread quickly throughout the Florida region was hurricanes. And it's because these little teeny tiny, I mean, they're teeny tiny flies, um, got pushed around a lot by the high winds. So there's really only so much you can do to stop it. Now, having a polyculture around your house is one of the better protections for it. So if you don't live next to an orange grove, you have higher odds that your crop, your plant's not gonna get infected by it, but it probably still will. My orange tree definitely has citrus greening plus other problems. It's old and the previous owners have used electric cords and it has grown into the branches. So there's only so much I can do about that. But when it comes to um, any citrus, there is data that University of Florida is doing to research um, the interaction that's happening between oak trees, especially Southern live oaks and your citrus. And what's interesting about Southern live oaks is they have a, a what's it, it's basically, it, it's able to compartmentalize itself. So this is how they're able to live for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years is basically they can segment off pieces. That's why like a whole branch will fall off, but a whole tree won't die. It's because it's able to do this kind of compartmentalizing of diseases. They think that aspect is having a positive impact. They've been doing tests a couple years ago using oak leaf tea. Now you don't need to get into doing oak leaf tea. Literally, if you have oaks, just collect the leaves and mulch around your orange tree with it. That's it. I did do some looking in to see if there's any um, newer updates on using the oak leaf tea and did they find any positive, neutral, or negative interactions between that and citrus and there were no updates that I could find. Um, so at this point, oak leaves to mulch your tree. That's about all you can do. And then you just keep your tree as healthy as possible because citrus greening basically slows the ability to move nutrition up to its leaves slash the fruit. And that's kind of is what it is. So there's nothing you're really going to be able to do to stop it. It's not like with canker, if we could take out the disease trees, we can contain it. It just, it's everywhere. Everywhere that grows citrus in the world has it. There's not really much to do about it at this point. I think about how to explain this. <laughs> so because how, the rate at which the disease spreads the tree by the time like an orange tree is starting to produce fruit you are really you're a lot further along in like how the disease is spreading through the tree versus a colomondin produces fruit much earlier in its life so the disease isn't as progressed that's a good way to put it so you can get much better harvest more frequently and turn it around a lot faster before you're gonna see massive impacts to your tree. So, which is why I recommend Kalamondins. They're easy, you get lots of fruit, and it's not more resistant, but where it's at in its cycle when it produces fruit is a lot earlier. Fun comment from Samalita007. She says that we call the ahise pepper ahi kachucha. Did I say that right? Ahi kachucha. That. And they make teas, jams, and cranberry sauce where she's from, which is Panama. Another comment from Erica, Erica. My Everglades tomatoes are refusing to grow, like two months trying, and they are tiny and nothing happens. Got Florida seeds from online. So one of the things when Bob sent me my Everglades tomatoes is he put a little note in there and he said they do take a really long time to germinate. So it is not unusual. And I saw this with Seminole pumpkins too, that the germination rate 
and then how long it takes them till you see them sprout. It's pretty significant. It's like, and maybe that has to do with why they do so well for Florida is they are very, it seems like picky about when they'll finally take off. So even if you have good seeds, they do kind of just hang out for a while and then they really, really take off. So you may have some seeds that are okay and they're just waiting for the right conditions and then they'll put their energy into like going. Cause even my seminal pumpkins, same thing. They kind of just didn't do anything. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I've got pumpkin plants and there they are and there they're going. And the Everglades tomatoes, you don't need many to take off. They are huge. They huge, huge, huge. Thank you, Ben. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Quiz. 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 <laughs> <Quiz. laughs> Becky Lapper says, thanks for these videos. Do carpenters bees make nests in the eaves of your house? We had quite a few holes, maybe at least 10 plus in the eaves of our house from carpenter bees this spring. Ugh, not good. I wanted them to stay in the garden. Any ideas how to control this? I, I do know some people, um, I think I was watching a guy in Alabama, Georgia was having a similar problem. So he made a bee nest, like those bee hotels, but he built it and then he put it on his house. And that was one of the ways that he was finding really, really effective. And then he was closing up all the other holes. I have not had that yet. I also have a lot of dead wood around, so it might be more <laughs> desirable to them <laughs> than uh, the eaves of my house. So as of yet, no, knock on wood, knock on wicker. I have not seen any of them making holes in mine. All of our eaves are painted, are yours painted? That might be something that's impacting it too. That would be kind of the main thing. And then I also have dead wood around, but that would might be a trick to try is put up a bee hotel near where they're going and so that you can kind of pull them away from the eaves of your house. And then Maria Sarah Queen Meets Green. I keep snake plants and other invasives, but pretty plants in pots outdoors. I'm so glad I didn't think of putting them in the ground and I appreciate you mentioning because I have toyed with the idea. Yes, that is, for some of the invasive plants, because they are ones that spread through roots, not seeds, they are like, you can keep them, but like in pots. And that's why if you have one of those like sterile seed ones, but they are got like aggressive tubers, you can contain them so you can get the pretty without getting the problems and being a good Floridian. So yes, absolutely, Maria, Sarah, I agree. So I do know people who keep them in like cemented in areas or they do similar with Mexican petunias. I kind of keep doing that with Mexican petunias until I figure out what I'm going to put in that place because they will be a pain to get rid of. And that's the thing is when you let them go for so long, uh, once you decide to get them out, you will regret that you let them go as long as you did. Southern Latitude. Hi there. She was agreeing that loofah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's an aggressive grower. And she said, I agree, it's an every third year plant. I no longer buy sponges, but I have plenty even with giving it away. That's a good, that's a really good strategy. I like that. That's a great idea. Just plant it every three years. I didn't save enough sponges to make it worth it yet, but that is a good tip going forward once I've saved some seeds. <laughs> Lori Hessler commented, I don't understand why big box stores are allowed to sell the invasive species. I like to hike and I have seen snake plants, Mexican petunias, and non-native lantana growing in many of our state parks. They shouldn't be allowed to sell the invasive species. Yeah, this is, so there was actually a really, really good lunch and learn for uh, Florida Native Plant Society last Friday. I will put a link in the description to the video. And um, it was, oh, what's her name? She is part of the actual government group that has the regulation for noxious weeds. And she did a really good, explanation of how a plant gets a noxious weed status versus a invasive species status and what the difference is and why you can do what you can do. So basically the noxious weed status is coming from the, um, not, not the United States Department of Agriculture, but basically the Florida version. And I might not be explaining this exactly well. This is why you should watch the video because she does a really good job explaining all the details, but that's basically where noxious weeds, that's where like Brazilian pepper, and like melaleuca and stuff like that are become like noxious weeds. And then the invasive plant species list is managed and created by what was FLEPPC. It's now, I guess, FISC. I learned something when I was on this lunch and learn. And they're the ones who have the invasive species list. And there is a whole group of botanists and ecologists and all bunch of people who 
build that list, but that is not part of the government regulated list. That's why there is no government regulation on it. <laughs> so your Home Depots, your Lowe's, they cannot sell noxious weeds. That would be um, a violation of regulation, uh, illegal. And invasive species, because it's an independent group, that's why it's not. So that's kind of the main difference of why they can sell them. I guess long and short, Lori, I agree. There is so much that's getting out and we're basically, I feel like chasing our tails because we're bringing in plants at a rate that by the time we're even identifying them for invasive species, they're, they're already, like basically the way they get on the invasive list is they basically have to be damaging our ecosystem already. So we're already having a problem before we put them even on the list. And they have to be really, really bad for our ecosystems slash our agriculture, which noxious weeds really, really are more focused on the agriculture part, but also now the ecosystem aspect. And so like by the time it's doing that, like we are so far down the road that I agree. I feel like there needs to be something different. Um, but you know what? This is why I am really supportive of Florida Native Plant Society. There are other groups too that they are working with regulators. They're, they even have lobbyists, I was learning the other day. So um, I think that's why it's really important to support them because they are working not only to educate us as individuals, but also to get systemic policy changes so that we can get to a place where it's not so easy to buy the things that are bad, right? So that's why I highly recommend you support them, um, volunteer with them. They do lots of great work. Robin's Nest 4715. Hey, Robin. I made the same mistake with Mexican petunia. Mm, haven't we all? Pretty, but it's taking over my front garden and needs it to be constantly managed. Question, do you recommend a rose variety that grows well in zone 10? I would love to try one like Rosa Rugosa for the hips to make jelly. You know, I haven't really looked into roses. I do know there are, a, there's like a variety. One, I think there's some roses my neighbor has. I was noticing them the other day, they were blooming and I was like, oh, because I have generally thought roses don't grow well here. And I noticed that and I thought, what the hey are those? So one, the short answer is Robin, I don't have varieties because I have never paid much attention to that because it has always seemed like a hard plant to grow here. But two, I did notice actually on our recent family trip to Disney, I did notice they had these small, bush roses but I don't know what variety they are um but they were very pretty and they smelled really good but I don't know if you can make a uh, rose of tea so I am not an expert on that that is an area I am very very not an expert on my heart cries this is a good comment and I this was an expansion on kind of our uh re plant regrets she said sunflowers actually act as a natural healer of the soil Evidently contaminated soil is prolific this year. And according to Jess from Roots and Refuge Farm, who got a bad load of contaminated soil, she planted sunflowers and also used mushroom to try to heal the soil. Yeah, so this actually kind of goes back to some of the things that David the Good has been talking about for years, which is, oh, I don't remember the name of the chemical, but basically it's a herbicide that's being used and it's a broadleaf herbicide. And a lot of our vegetable crops are broadleafs and a lot of native plants are broadleafs. And so when we use that compost, um, on our crops, then I mean, it's going to kill them is what it is. It doesn't care the fact that, you know, your broad leaf is a broccoli or a tomato and not a whatever weed it's supposed to kill. So that's causing problems. And yes, um, and not only is it, um, I hadn't heard about this from Roots and Refuge, but I did know that in some of the, um, where we've had, oh, some of the, like the nuclear waste sites, they've actually used sunflowers um, as one of the methods to get some of the contaminate, contaminated material out. So they are really good at having some very prolifically deep root systems. I don't know that you should eat the seeds off of those ones. Um, so while they do have a deterrent to keep other plants away from themselves, they are really good at pulling up nutrients. So that is a good counterpoint for why you should use sunflowers. I'm not anti-sunflowers. All I was saying was just location. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, now knowing what they do, I should probably not plant them so close to other things. Kayleen West artist said, have you tried eating loofah? I saw the young vegetable is edible. It would likely produce more with some pickling too. Oh, with some picking too, <laughs> not pickling. Uh, yeah, we no, we have eaten some of the younger loofah. It is very similar. I mean, I, all I can say is very similar to zucchini. 
Um, I think the challenge for us was, is we don't have that many zucchini recipes that we eat. So I was very quickly like, what are we, what are we doing with all this? <laughs> that was my mistake and a mistake that if you don't already eat a lot of zucchini and you grow loofah, um, the rate at which you get zucchini loofahs um, is a lot faster. And so having recipes ready to go, and I, it hit me kind of towards the end of having the loofah that I probably could do what um, I think, who is it, Becky on Acre Homestead does, an 1870 Homestead Rachel. They shred it and they use it for like thickener, pasta filler, whatever's in a lot of dishes. So, but I didn't think of that till later. And I, we were in the middle of lots of other activities that I was just like, ah, forget it, whatever. Um, but in the future, but yeah, it, no, I mean, it's texturally very, not that outside, you need to definitely skin it, which that takes a little bit more effort. Um, but from a literal flavor and then the interior texture, yeah, I mean, it is just like zucchini. So shred it next time if I have too much. <laughs> Elise Curran says, are you an ENFJ and has been an S type? I'm an ENTJ and I have to work on my relationships with S types with their focus on details because I'm so invested in the big picture. <laughs> no, I am not an ENFJ. I am actually an ENTJ. So I am an ENTJ. I always test as an ENTJ. Um, so if you aren't familiar with this, this is called the Myers-Briggs test. It's really common for business organizations to have you do these because they want to know about your personality. So I have done it back when I was getting my master's. I had to do it multiple times in my professional career and I always end up as ENTJ. And those who know me say generally, yeah, that fits. People who work with me, people who work for me. So uh, the E it stands for, the E is extroverted, which probably y'all could guess. Um, but extrovert I always hear is like, it's not just that you're outgoing, but that you get energized by being around people, which is 100% true. When I was an intern many moons ago at Motorola, I do not, I'm not as productive when I am an individual contributor. So I like being part of teams. I like helping people. It's a big part of how I get energized, which is why I like doing videos, helping y'all. Uh, the N stands for intuitive. And yes, I starts, intuitive starts with an I, but they go with an N. So intuitive. Um, this is where it's like big picture stuff, not as much about details. And then uh, T is thinking. So I like to logic things out, which I think you guys can pick up through videos because I'm like this, then this, and then this, if that. And then uh, judging, which I forget what that stands for. I think, oh, it's like, it's very, oh, makes decisions based off of kind of like more fact-based stuff, not based on feelings, which is very, Lots of people who work with me are very like, she is very systemic and fair and, um, which is kind of why some of the things I used to do for the big company I did make a lot of sense. One, looking at a lot of data, but two, I did a lot of stuff to turn around teams that were dysfunctional teams. And part of doing that was by making things very fair. Cause when people don't think things are fair, then they can't trust each other and they can't build relationships and then they act not so good. So I always put in stuff to make sure everyone felt valued and it, things were done in a very logical and fair manner. So that always played out a lot. So yes, I am very much an ENTJ. And Ben is a ISTJ, if I remember right. So he is introverted, not by a lot. He's super social. If you ever meet him, he's very social, um, but he is Mr. Details for sure. And he definitely is very logical and he pro cons data for thinking through things. And then, yeah. And then he's a J for fair stuff. That's why we get along because our decision-making is very based on like logic, thought process, decision tree, pro con list. So that is us. And that is why companies, there's like data out there. They'll say that ENTG is a, is the commander personality. So they're the person who's gonna be in charge and run the team, um, which is weird because a lot of people who know me, like I was never very big into being the person in charge for the sake of it, though I ended up being in charge of stuff because I like helping. And if no one is stepping up or knows how to step up, then I just automatically start helping people. But there are many people who worked for me who ended up becoming my boss because I just like helping. I'm, it's like Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. So ENTJ, the commander. Question, Sandy Salzman said, thank you for sharing. I am also a poodle lover. Yeah. 
Yes, we love poodles. Poodles get ragged on way more than they should. Poodles are awesome, awesome dogs. Um, she said she had three growing up. Cool, me too. And then question for consideration. I can scatter Cosmos or Zinnia seeds and they grow and are super colorful and showy. Are there any natives that are in tall, colorful and prolific? <sighs> okay. Um, so nothing's gonna be like, not there's no one for ones right zinnias are zinnia cosmos are cosmos and zinnias and cosmos are not native to florida but they are native to the americas so we are fans of fellow american indigenous flowers when it comes to being similar in color and size like you're going to get things that are size wise but more seasonal you can get things that have swaths. So your cone flowers, like your purple cone flowers, they won't get as tall, but they can create those nice swaths of color. So purple cone flower, orange cone flower, and your black eyed Susans will have kind of that really like big impact flower, like more similar size, and then just the sheer color. If you're looking for swaths of color, but not in the same structure, your Coreopsis is <laughs> um, can create those kind of huge sweeps of color though they're a little bit more delicate and they will have long seasons throughout the year um, then you have your seasonals that are really colorful but can be pretty prolific like your golden rods and your um, what the heck are they called liatris uh, blazing stars um, which are pretty like bold color but all of them have like very different structures I guess tropical sage, if you plant enough tropical sage, even though they're small flowers, um, they can create some, if you get enough of them and they will self seed like crazy. <laughs> you can sprinkle those seeds and you will definitely get lots of them. Bill Jackson asks question. Do you have people helping themselves to your fruits and vegetables that you grow in your front yard? Also, have you put in any bee boxes in your garden? This is a good question. Um, I have not had any, well, I've had critters help themselves to stuff in my front yard, but not people. Mm -mm. No, um, our neighbors are very respectful of it. I know people joke with my, they don't joke with me, but they joke with my certain neighbors commission about like, um, I know some people have said they have banana envy of me. I just actually met somebody who watches the channel and they said they walk by our yard and they, <laughs> they get banana envy looking at it. But no, nobody has taken anything. And I think this is very neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, I do know some people have these problems. We have good neighbors and probably also the way our neighborhood is laid out also helps support the fact that people don't just snatch things. So those probably help, but no, I have not had anyone steal vegetables other than critters. Critters have stolen things at times. So um, when it comes to bee box houses or bee hotels, uh, no, we have not added any to our yard. And you guys see, I get a lot of bees. We do leave, we have stick piles. And <laughs> now that I've gotten rid of the landscapers, um, I don't prune everything back. I do leave some of the, especially the native plants, I will leave dead twigs on them for our bee population. Um, Cause when it comes to our bees, about 30% of the species that live in Florida use like the sticks and would even possibly use a bee hotel like the carpenter bees that we talked about a little bit earlier um but the other 70 percent they all actually do um in ground nesting so and those are ones that actually need a little bit more help probably right now because of the pesticide herbicide problem so no i do not uh, i do not i do not i do not mary p what's up mary p she says this was great i'm looking forward to your daily post question have you tried growing muscadet tying grapes we just planted eight. Oh, mary <laughs> no i have not um because muscadine grapes are very aggressive natives very aggressive um if you ever see i had a friend at work and he had um non-producing muscadine grape vines and they go back 20 30 feet I, he was like right up against like a a nature preserve type area in his neighborhood and he was like i have tried killing these so many times and he, he was trying to get me to say that he could jump the fence and go throw pesticide on, or herbicide on it and i was like um it's native it's supposed to be there also there's probably more vines and you should just cut it back from time to time and let it run <laughs> towards your property um i do though i do get the frustration so because they are such aggressive growers and they take up a lot of space i have not and this is one of the things when it comes to 
crops I've never tried before. I try to be very careful about not just being like, yes, let's, let's just grow things that are going to take up a ton of space if I don't know what they taste like. So maybe I'll change my mind if I have some muscadine grapes and I might think of a spot, but I don't want to have just one. Like if I don't love them that much and they're going to take up a lot of space, I will probably not ever grow them, but that's kind of my main reason. But that doesn't mean you can't, you should totally grow it. But eight, my, my watch out would be, oh my, that's gonna take up a lot of space. Let's keep planting with Nemo commented about the garden being the front yard. I spend way more time on my front yard garden areas because of my neighbors, I make sure everything is more manicured. I really think putting a small garden in your front yard is a great way to start. Yes, so many people actually commented that those who have them in their front gardens, how much more better relationships they have with their neighbors because it's in their front yard. So something definitely to think about if that's, if your neighbors is the reason you've hesitated, um, take that fear away. A lot of people have found that they get in, uh, they get way more, way more interaction with their neighbors by having their gardens in the front yard. This is the video, what to grow in December. So Gina said, Hey Jacqueline, I'm having the hardest time with pumpkins. I paired them with sweet potatoes and the leaves are growing great, but I keep getting little pumpkins with the flower but then they fall off after about a week. What am I doing wrong? I'm in Wellington, Florida. Um, so you might not be doing anything wrong. So with pumpkins, what you're getting is um, the pumpkins aborting the fruit for, it's not getting enough of something. And if it's right now or a couple weeks ago, it might be because the temperatures are a little lower or it's not getting enough intense sun because the sun's weakening we're heading towards some of our shortest days so it might not be getting enough sun to set fruit at this time so you may not need to do anything um what i would think about gina is just hang on until we hit the warmer months and you may find that the pumpkins just turn around all on their own because they're trying they're just waiting on something and if your sweet potatoes are doing good and they're still putting out really nice big green leaves it might be a sun issue from a sun intensity so I would think I, that would be my thought process because I will tell you mine have been putting on flowers. They've been putting on the little fruits and they've been dropping also right now. And it's mostly driven by the fact that the sun's just not intense and they're getting a lot more shade than they were in the hotter parts of the year. So I'm just gonna let them run around. They seem happy. And then when it warms up and the sun gets a little bit more intense, then they should take off again. So Crystal733 asked, is the Puerto Rican black bean a different variety of bean than what you grow, what you can buy in the grocery store? Yes, that is a different variety. Those beans are bigger than what you would get out of a Puerto Rican black bean pod. Um, the only person I'm aware of who can sell it is, not who can sell it, but who does sell it is the Urban Harvest. Um, I did do some sleuthing a few months ago to see if anyone else had it online and I did not see anyone else. So get a neighbor who has it or you're gonna have to run over to St. Pete and pick some up from Elise. So that's what you got for that right now. But yeah, it's not the same plan. Lara said you, Lara, <laughs> you said you have a turkey carcass in your compost. I've heard other state never put in meat and compost. Yes, um, I did a whole video about that. You can check it out about putting a whole turkey carcass in my, and what happens. The long story short is black soldier flies can eat meat. And that's one of the things is most people who are composting are trying to deal with worms and worms don't eat the meat. And so that's bad for worms. But if you're doing black soldier fly composting, you can totally put in entire meat carcasses. You can put in dead animals. I've put dead animals in there. Uh, that might be too much information, but yeah, we had a night heron die right in front of our house. And so we scooped it up and chucked it in there and they ate it all. <laughs> Rick Ritchie said one pepper. It may not produce because of the male female pollinator thing, birds and bees, etc. cetera. <laughs> one lonely plant looking for love. <laughs> this is in reference to my one lonely ahise pepper in my front garden bed. I actually found that um, just having one in other locations was totally fine. And my neighbors who had it also just have one in a pot. I don't know. I think it's just not happy. I think it's too shaded out, but it could be the birds and the bees or a lack thereof. So that's okay. We have some plans for rearranging things to get more sunlight and that should help overall do a much better job. Sonia Moran asks, have you tried true yam yet? Got one from a friend and it was worth it. I had, um, well, if you mean like cassava, I've had cassava. I've had cassava bread. Someone I worked with, oh, she would go to this place and get cassava bread and bring it into work for me. And 
it was so good. I miss that cassava bread. If I had the time and the will and like to bake, I would make cassava bread all the time. And I would weigh so much more than I do because I love it so much. I think she said she used to pick it up. It was like a 7-Eleven or something. <laughs> something she used to be like, ah, uh, Ursula. She would just be like, I pick it up. I pick it up, you eat it. And it was so yummy and I miss it so much. Um, but I have never used them otherwise personally. The Choco Mados says, have you ever tried pigeon peas? You plant them in February and they fruit in the winter. I get about a pound every other day just in three trees. They're the, the bush kind called Lazaro in Spanish. They only grow to four feet. I am not, but now you got me thinking and maybe you got others thinking, maybe we need to try pigeon peas. Maybe not yet. I need to focus, but noted, listed, yes, great idea. Hope you enjoyed all those questions, comments, and answers from all, basically week one of Vlogmas's videos. And next up, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna hit all the video too. So I hope you enjoyed this and you've been enjoying the holiday season and I'll see you soon. Bye.